Hi friends, uh, welcome to Be Waste Wise. And we're sorry about this tiny bit of a delay in starting the webinar today. Uh, I'm Shweta Bandapani. I'm the community builder at Be Waste Wise. Today, the topic for today's webinar is design and consumption for the circular economy. We have Robert Crocker, who's a consumption and waste expert who's moderating today's webinar. He has moderated other webinars for us in the past. Please head to the video panel section of our website and you will find the webinars that Robert has organized and has also taken part as a panelist. Robert is gonna to speak to uh, three other panelists today. We have Juan Levitsky, who is a waste and recycling expert. Nikki Wallace, who's a director at Net Zero Lab. And Paul Huxtable, who's an industrial designer. As usual, we will take your questions. Please drop your questions in the Q&A section and Robert will pick and choose them wherever he finds them relevant in the conversation. So over to you, Robert. Thank you so much, Zeta. Um, and hello, everybody. Uh, this is a really um, interesting topic because more and more governments around the world are now embracing the circular economy, but um, uh, much of it is being driven by um, the waste industry, by recycling and the, the, waste, the waste crisis, the global waste crisis. So there's a, um, uh, but the circular economy involves, uh, as everyone says, involves more than this. It should involve design, policy, and also consumption. And unfortunately, these topics tend to get left off the list uh, in, um, it's only really now that in more recent days that people are beginning to look at um, the implications of the circular economy for design and consumption. So um, what I'd like to do is to start um, asking my esteemed panelists, um, uh, if we look at circular businesses in the world, after we look at a few standout larger companies, most are relatively small scale niche companies that are embracing the circular economy, uh, perhaps where you have an inspired leader who will seize an opportunity that seems profitable and good for the environment. How can more uh, businesses be induced into dealing with uh, the consumption end of this spectrum? The fact that we are now producing more goods more efficiently for more people faster and at lower costs. And this business model now dominates everywhere in the world. How can we um, induce those companies producing, say, everyday plastic goods to start embracing um, the, circular, the circular economy? So maybe I should start with uh, Paul and Vaughan who are um, uh, particularly um, uh, involved with this. Um, yeah, Vaughan here. This is a really, it's a really difficult issue to scale circular economy enterprises quickly. And I think the part of the problem is that it's, it's very hard for companies to get a line of sight on circular economy. So what we don't have are a large number of case studies in multiple sectors, which allows people to learn about what they might do in their own business. Um, but aside from that, I think probably government needs to play a stronger role in the fact that, um, you know, some, some of the small companies and some of the large companies are making a leap of faith, but it's not a level playing field. So while, there's, while some are making large advances in this area, um, the others don't see the opportunity and it's also, they think it comes at a cost to them. So I think government needs to level the playing field a bit and apply some incentives to get people to change their business models and to also work with companies to enable them to see the opportunities. And I think that's starting to happen, but it's still, um, it's too slow and it's in too small of a scale at the moment. So I guess it's my turn. Hi everyone. Um, and uh, hello from South Australia, sunny South Australia, although it's cold. 
Um, I agree very much with what Vaughan um, is saying. Um, but one of the biggest problems I find, bear in mind, I've been uh, practicing as a designer since 1971. Um, but uh, and to give you a bit of context, um, in in 19 between 1971 and now, whilst the population on Earth has increased two times, just over two times, the production of plastics, for example, has increased seven times. So the the use of the production and use of plastics is op, is running at about <coughs> two and a half to three times the pop, population growth. That's the first problem, and that that highlights. Uh, uh, design is basically about solving problems, and and uh, um, and as a designer, um, uh, that to me seems to be uh, an enormous uh, problem. So how do we uh, how how can we reconcile that? Part of the problem I think is that uh, manufacturers and developers of products don't really understand the true cost uh, to our community of their their products. They're really only interested in designing it and manufacturing it and getting it out the door. But actually there are ongoing costs uh, related to that product and it depends on the, uh, and that cost will vary depending on how long that product lasts. And ironically, I can remember back in 1971 when I was designing plastic products, we were designing them to last 30 and 40 years. And some of those products are still being used in homes in, in Australia uh, and the United States today. So we need transparency. We need to understand the true cost. And, and I think once we understand the true cost uh, and allocate that cost where, where it, um, it deserves to be, then I think we're going to see a dramatic change in attitudes and a greater acceptance of circular economy. Thank, thanks, Paul. And thanks, Dawn. Um, that's a very useful start. Um, uh, you know, you, we, we brought up the, um, uh, the issue of design and um, how um, uh, circular design, designing products in a way that they last um, is, is not only very challenging uh, for businesses, you know, what is the business model? Where, where is the, the value here? You know, question comes up. But um, designers themselves have since 1970 got out of the habit of designing things to last. And this, this raises some very interesting issues because until very recently, um, uh, circular design, designing for the circular economy was uh, a very rare, like a unicorn, a very rare beast indeed. There are a few groups, um, experimental groups, there are a few people advocating for this, but um, very few main uh, mainstream companies were embracing it. And I think this is beginning to change, but. What I'd, um, what I'd like to do is ask, um, you know, how can working designers create goods that satisfy consumers um, trained to expect things that just don't last? Um, you know, if, if, for example, you know, the mobile phone we have, um, you know, is now designed to last or expected to last only a year, um, how do we go about reconsidering this and um, in a sense retraining consumers and this brings up not only design but communication and advertising as well and uh, it's this so I'd like to bring Nikki in at this point if possible as well thank you thanks Rob um yeah it's a really tricky issue for design um we're, we're trained, and, and I come from a design background as well, and we're, we're trained in some very particular ways that aren't necessarily suited um, to what's needed within circular economy spaces. And so the, the shifts that need to happen within design to, to orient design towards a more systems um, kind of focus are quite significant. And that, that starts with training. Um, and, and for many designers that are out there now retraining um, and finding new ways of seeing design in, in some broader um, social and cultural contexts. Um, but there's a, another kind of underlying issue um, that, that we can probably start scratching away at, um, which is this idea about relationships. And I think we're, we're asking designers to design um, goods and, and products and services that might um, bring people into closer, stronger, longer um, relationships with those, with those products. But we don't necessarily have those kinds of relationships with people or nature. 
um, anymore. And so I, I'm wondering whether some of the work that needs to be done is actually at a deeper um, a deeper level that we need to start focusing on how we bring um, people back into relationships, not just with goods, but with one another, with the world around us. Um, and so there's some, um, some deeper, more cultural and social work um, that needs to be done um, at both an individual, at a designer, at a, a business um, and at a political level um, to start to nurture this idea about um, relationships between things. Do you think, um, um, I mean, this is something, Paul, you might want to comment on as well. Um, I was reading recently a, a report or an article that was saying that um, in a particular small experimental group of consumers, they found that um, only about 50% of the consumers' needs were being met by uh, electronic products. Uh, I, I was a bit shocked because I thought, oh, you know, Apple would be on top of this. Um, <laughs> I'm just, uh, now this is looking at it from a circular perspective. Um, are we actually um, receiving products that uh, are frustrating simply because it's convenient to the manufacturer um, uh, who, who wants us to buy the next best thing? Um, you know, is, is there a way of perhaps um, uh, the designer reconsidering their role in this, uh, you know, to do, as Nikki suggested, to create a longer term, deeper relationship with a product so that uh, we actually want to keep it? I mean, look at our shirts, you know, they last two or three years now. Um, in theory, those textiles could last 10 or 20, you know, if looked after. Um, you know, if if the fast fashion industry was wiped out overnight and we had to start again, um, you know, how would we go about selling a shirt to somebody or a, a product to somebody that would last ten years instead of two? Wow, <laughs> that that's a that's a very very complex uh, question, um, but but I. I need to, before I answer that question about the clothing, uh, I mean, for me, good design is, is entirely a, 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 you know, a human centered approach where, where both social, environmental and economic goals uh, uh, come, come into play. And traditionally, traditionally, I think in the last perhaps 20, 30 years, they, they've been seen by industry almost to be adversarial goals, uh, but they're not, they're entirely compatible. And we're living in an age where they need to be uh, entirely compatible. Uh, so, in terms of, of clothing, um, there are, you know, I've got a lot of faith in in uh, manufact in uh, the um, uh, in industry developing techniques to re reprocess plastics, provided there is a mechanism in place and a pathway so that they can receive those those goods and reprocess them. And also there's a burgeoning online market for um, discarded clothing, uh, which, which now, uh, you know, is, is um, people are making a lot of money from it and they're actively selling high quality clothing that's perhaps um, to the original purchaser may not be suited to their fashion sense um, in, in one or two years time. That's a whole nother problem. But um, you know, there, I think there are uh, mechanisms being being put in place now that are that are um, economically viable to enable, firstly, reuse of that clothing, uh, or repurposing of that of the fabric that that is used to make that clothing. I've got a lot of confidence that there there is enough happening in that space. What I don't have confidence in is the ability of governments to move fast enough to respond to the um, rapid um, um, growth of waste uh, in, in this world. Um, and I think that's an area that needs to be uh, focused on uh, certainly into the future. So, so Vaughan, what are your thoughts on this? Because you've been working in this space for longer than anyone here. Um, I, um, yeah, it's, um, this is a, as uh, Paul mentioned, it's a very complex problem, but there's, there are a number of paradoxes or ironies in this as well. So people design products that are designed to last a very 
short period of time, but they're using materials which will last forever. So they're using plastics and metals which will outlive most of us on planet Earth. And when they do break down, particularly for plastics, they break down into smaller and smaller pieces. So um, the, and the, the, here's another example. The other day, I'm in the local, my local supermarket, and on there's a new product on the shelf, and it's a toothbrush, but it's got a wooden handle. Now, are we going to are we going to chop down all the trees to make wooden handles for toothbrushes, or are we going to use plastics? in toothbrushes, but where are we going to harvest um, used toothbrushes to come back in through a circular economy to be turned into, say, car bumper bars or some other um, product that, that can be used to um, further the life of, of that particular material. And in terms of the waste, the scale of waste, yes, it's increasing globally and it's, and it's growing faster than population growth. And the reason for that is, is because people, uh, as they come out of poverty and they move into um, the other echelons, if you like, of having more and more disposable income, you know, there's been books written about affluenza. That's where we're all headed. So everyone wants to get better materials, better quality of life um, and cheaper products. And that comes at the expense of the environment. It comes at the expense of um, other people down the hierarchy who are either poor or less privileged than the rest of us who have the expendable income. So there are, there are a number of um, lines of thought here that I think intersect to make this what would be called a wicked problem. And part of the reason that, it, that the consumption aspect hasn't been focused on more generally is because our entire economy is geared to growth and it's geared to advertising, marketing and selling more and more product. And so it's very hard for someone to say, hang on, we need to relook at this because everyone's moving down this pipeline in a particular way. So for government, um, you know, they're elected by the people in most cases, not in all. But, um, you know, this is a, on the one hand, you've got shareholders demanding more, more money to come back through the companies that are producing these products. And on the other hand, you've got governments becoming more concerned about the critical materials in their economies and also trying to balance um, coming out of poverty and increasing people's ability to afford a quality of life and education and so on, whilst keeping the environment in in balance as well. And I think it's becoming really, really difficult. Um, and what we're missing is, I think, um, are models that enable us to measure and then work out what's the best approach here. When it's a knife edge on a particular product or a design, which way should we be going? But it's very complex and it's multi-layered. Is that enough for? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Vaughan. Uh, yeah, no, I, I guess, um, um, you know, there are examples, small scale of people doing very good things with uh, products. Um, one um, German designer who uses QR codes in her clothes um, uh, has creates that relationship or tries to create that relationship that Nikki was talking about. Um, you know, where the, the owner can um, communicate, can understand uh, where the uh, product comes from, how it was made, what it was made from, um, the contents in the box, as it were. Because this is one of the, one of the problems we face is that uh, we don't know where, probably for the first time in history, we don't know where our products come from. And so, um, you know, the, that, that trust that needs to be rebuilt or created to um, allow for a circular economy, often that is not really understood or talked about. Um, instead, we are um, um, we, we're, we have to trust the idea that this is a green product; it's recyclable. Uh, the fact that it's probably the wrong plastic 
um, and that uh, it may only be recyclable once, doesn't really uh, come to the conversation. So in a sense, my understanding is um, uh, the circular economy will require much greater transparency uh, from the manufacturer um, and also the government will probably have to push manufacturers to be more transparent. And we have the technology to do this. You know, the QR code, the app, can you can learn a lot. But if you put the QR code and the app in the hands of, say, a standard advertiser, they will do everything to create smoke screens. So you never get to know. You know, um, so so I guess I guess what I'm saying is that working with um, a more collaborative approach where you're using technology um, uh, in a creative way to communicate with your, uh, your, your customer is a good start. And in terms of the larger question you raised about the economics one, um, this is in a way the sting in the tail of um, the scorpion of efficiency, you know, that the more efficient we are, the more stuff we make, the cheaper it becomes, we can sell more of it, which is good for poor people. They can access that thing that before was a luxury. But um, the, the downside of it is um, their margins making that go down. So they have to make more and more. <laughs> and so um, we end up with the plastic toothbrush. Um, you know, your, your example of the toothbrush, you know, in... Um, in China, there'll still be somebody making the old plastic toothbrushes. It doesn't matter how good the toothbrush we invent is going to be. And this is this is where governments, in a way, have to step in. Um, uh, Vaughan, do you think, uh, looking at our history in South Australia, where we've managed to restrict plastic bags, we've managed to create a container deposit scheme, we, we recycle probably more than anyone else in the Southern Hemisphere, um, you know, this, th what are the lessons that you've learned in this pathway to the circular economy from a government point of view? Um, yeah, you're right. We've, we've had a long track record in trying to deal with this. And I think in my time in a more systemic way. So when, when container deposits first came in, it was because there was a litter problem. It, it wasn't really conceived as a way of um, extended produce responsibility about um, taking care of the resources and, and, and getting those materials back so that we can reuse them or recycle them. So the, the kind of um, the, the headset around this is, has gradually evolved over the years. Um, but there's some very pertinent learnings, I think. Um, one is that in my experience anyway, the public are very much attuned to getting this change. And the reason I say that is because whenever we went out to do a public um, market survey around container deposits or single use plastics or bags or whatever, we would get between 85 and 97% of the public saying, this is a good thing to do. And it's something that we, want to see happen and we see the not only the environmental benefit but it's also in the in the in container deposit legislation there's an economic benefit that flows back to the consumer who gets paid for however many drink bottles he returns or she returns so i think the they they see the opportunity here to reduce the impact on the environment but also set up new business models um, but they may not perceive them as new business models. They see them as opportunities for people to um, create markets and do things with these, with these products. The other thing I would suggest is that um, because of the products we've chosen in the single-use plastics, so the plastic bags, um, stirrers and cutlery and things like that, people get engaged around that. So the general public see that stuff and they wonder why they've got a free knife and fork, or the, they wonder why the drink comes with three straws and not one. Um, so it, it, it kind of touches common sense in terms of what people are expecting. And, and 
you can have a discussion around a barbecue or anything about all these topics because um, people have to deal with it in their everyday, everyday lives. And the other thing, the third thing that I'd say that we've learned out of this is that this businesses still survive. If governments intervene to create a level playing field, then it's the same for everybody, then we don't see individual businesses falling by the wayside because they're being undermined by people who don't want to comply with the, with the legislation. So a legislative underpinning, I think, creates a level playing field. It enables businesses to compete equally, um, but it also means that we're, we're actually pegging their behaviour at a certain level so that we don't slip backwards. The problem with voluntary systems is that, um, so for example, the national level here in Australia, we've had national packaging covenant, covenant and a range of other um, kind of voluntary systems dealing with batteries and other things. The risk is that that's fine when everybody agrees to it, but you only need one to drop out the bottom end and say, oh, this is too hard. This is costing me too much money. I'm not doing it anymore. And there's no repercussions for that. Then the rest of the market goes, well, yeah, he's probably right. So we're not going to do it either, although we disagree. You know, So I think that the legislative um, underpinning transparency around standards and about compliance um, will be coming will be becoming more and more important as time goes by. Thanks, Ron. Um, yeah, Nikki. Um, uh, one of the sort of aspects of this which we haven't really touched upon. I mean, if we see legislation as a kind of a ratchet, you know, that can't go backwards. Hopefully, I mean, of course, you might get, you know, a um, a president a a leader who comes in and says, this is terrible, we need a free market, um, let, let any, anything go. You know, that might happen, but you know, we, we have to look on the bright side. Uh, the good thing about legislation, in a sense, is that it raises standards. And as companies raise standards, then consumers start to see the value in those standards. Um, but a lot of uh, interesting um, experiments, uh, businesses in the circular economy, um, you know, are, are really um, uh, based upon um, people who have vision, but often special collaborations with other companies, with designers, with uh, people perhaps outside their comfort zone. And um, uh, Nikki, you have spent a lot of time working in this space, collaboration, co-creation. Would you like to comment on, on uh, that role within the circular economy? And I think Paul also has experience of this. So. Yeah, I, I think this is one of those um, uh, almost undervalued aspects of circular economies where we, we really do need to come into um, every new product space, every new um, business endeavour with the idea of, of collaboration and, and effective communication across, um, across disciplines in mind. And I, I think, Paul, you touched earlier on um, the idea of products that are made that don't necessarily um, align with, with what the market wants or with what people really need. Um, out of a product. And I think that's one of the really valuable aspects of, of co-creation and particularly of co-design, where we start to see um, the, the people who will benefit from the things being designed um, as equal participants in the design um, of, those, of those products. And there are different roles that designers start to play um, in those kinds of scenarios. And I think there's a a bit of a learning curve um, involved there. There's a, a bit of a need to, to take the expert hat off um, and allow other people to participate in what have been relatively closed off kinds of processes. Um, but the benefit from shifting into more collaborative spaces is significant. And we, we see that in, um, uh, in, in every project that, that we work in within the lab, where we're not, um, we're not equipped to do any of the things that we want to do independently we're, we're we're reliant on people coming in with other levels of expertise with other perspectives um, on how something might work or on on what else might be possible 
Um, and that kind of plurality, bringing in those multiple perspectives is part of what um, creates some really significant opportunities in those spaces where um, we're able to kind of open, um, open our perception and see more. Um, see more of what might be possible, see more of, of um, a, a connection between the things that are being made and the, the ways that they can be useful. Um, and so co-design and, and co-creation become quite, um, quite pivotal. And especially when we start to talk about circular economies where we're relying on um, multiple businesses, multiple um, uh, potential um, legislation changes um, and multiple ways of participating that rely on us all working together. So there's no one business that can um, you know, go circular uh, without considering uh, where their waste might be valuable, how they might be able to um, reduce the amount of waste that they're making in the first place, where their market, where their potential market um, might be. There are a lot of different um, cross-sectoral, cross-disciplinary um, aspects to, um, to, to shifting into those more circular, um, circular models where we start to, to find ourselves again in, um, in relationships rather than in, um, in silos. Um, so collaboration and communication becomes key. So this is a sort of long lunch version of um, circular design. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so so I, ha I have an example that I, I've been involved with for the last uh, 12 years. The photograph you see behind me is a pile of rubbish. It's a pile of waste. They are oyster baskets used in the production of oysters. Globally, each one of those baskets is about 750 millimetres long. And the problem with those baskets is that they, um, they've been supplied uh, to this oyster farmer um, and uh, they've lasted less than 12 months. They're broken. Uh, they have a warranty of only 12 months. So um, this oyster farmer, to his amazing credit, uh, decided that he and a group of other oyster farmers across Australia wanted to um, um, design and manufacture their own baskets originally for their own purposes. But, old, but uh, obviously they had market opportunity elsewhere. And uh, now I was asked to get involved uh, as a designer. Um, I'm not an oyster farmer. I knew nothing about oyster farming. Uh, and so what I was really pleased about was that these oyster farmers were prepared to step way outside their comfort zone to find people that they, with experience in particular skill sets that would enable them to explore as many options as possible to come up with the right solution to their problem. And so, um, uh, and I've, Right throughout the bit their their business structure, I've been assisting them not only in the product development, which is what you would typically imagine a, a designer would do, but also in in the way in the material selection, in the way that they they manufacture the product, in the way they package their product, in the way they ship their product internationally and and interstate, and in, in, even in the way that they test uh, test their product and make sure that you know it does perform um, so the the result the result was um, um, after uh, testing this product for now for about 12 years um, they've had no failures so what what does that enable them to do I mean obviously they they, um, the, the cost actually was slightly higher, maybe I guess about four or five percent higher. But when you when you imagine that each hectare of oyster lease uh, has about two hundred and fifty thousand dollars worth of infrastructure, and this particular oyster farmer, for example, has thirty hectares, you can imagine if that pro if that uh, packaging is uh, or basket is failing after a year, you can imagine the cost. So all of a sudden he's got, he's now got a new design and a new system to, in, to deliver that product to uh, other oyster farmers that um, uh, um, really does not fail. And it enables him, it enabled him to, uh, me to make the suggestion that instead of offering a one year warranty on that product, uh, which is what all the oyster basket manufacturers do, I said, well, why don't you offer a five-year warranty on that product? 
And that one single move um, uh, drew enough attention to his new product and his new business to enable him to export the product. Now he's exporting to, I believe, about 12 countries and I think 80% of his manufacture is, is exported. So, so the concept of using design in a collaborative way throughout the value chain has enabled this um, uh, business to go from one that simply wanted baskets for their own farms to one which is now selling products to 12 countries uh, and uh, which has in effect reduced the amount of waste or amount of the number of bro broken baskets by, by 80 or 90 percent. So um, you know, there's an economic gain, there's an environmental gain. It's a win-win for everyone. That's just one of many examples. It's a very good example because, um, you know, as I was saying, there's a sort of a ratchet in standards. If you, um, you know, once you put in that five-year warranty, um, everyone else has to basically compete with that. You've changed the standard. And uh, particularly yep. if legislation comes in behind it, and says, okay, you can't make this product out of this material because it's going to be a problem after a year. You know, um, uh, yeah. and I, I think there's probably, you know, in a sense, uh, there's an economic side of this, but there's also a material science side of this that there's an awful lot of terrible materials out there. And, um, you know, you've, you've highlighted one of them, but there's, uh, there's dozens and dozens. So in every, in every area. But, um, now, yeah, now, uh, one, one problem, if I, if I might just add, one problem is that uh, virtually every plastic product has to have a recycle symbol on it, and it's a, a triangle of, of three arrows, and, and each plastic um, um, notation, I guess uh, the number of plastics is, is uh, I think, uh, listed as seven different plastic categories from one to seven. Um, and you have polyolefins and, AB and styrenic materials and nylons and et cetera. But there's a number seven category, which has literally thousands and thousands of different types of materials in that one category, simply because they haven't got enough numbers to apply. Uh, this is one of the problems that we have in, in, uh, uh, in the circular economy is that there are so many different plastic types, many of which cannot be mixed, many, many of which... Um, cannot be reused. Uh, so that, that is just one of the considerations that we have to deal with as we move more and more to the, uh, to the circular economy and recyclability and sustainability. Yes, it's almost like we have to um, draw the two ends of the, the chain together and uh, help um, the manufacturer understand that what their materials are gonna look like as waste uh, you know, what kind of future they could have from those materials. Um, and I think a lot of people will just select materials and then say, oh, that works, that will do, that's below cost, without really understanding uh, the complexities of the future of that material. So now, Sveta, I'm probably running over time. Is there a... Is it... uh, you have another 15 minutes, Robert. Oh, good. Okay. And no, no questions. I, no questions so far. Okay. There are there are a few comments out there though. Yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah. I mean, training. One of the issues here is how do we get designers on board, and um, getting consumers on board is very interesting as well. Um, transparency we've mentioned, and uh, there's a lot of technology that enables transparency, greater transparency. Uh, QR codes, um, you know, uh, platforms, a lot of people are moving to that space, some of the big guys as well. Um, from the designer's point of view, my experience is there's nothing better, nothing more enjoyable for an old bloke like me to go into a design studio and um, get the students handling waste products. <laughs> This is what it's like, you know. This is this is. There's mountains of this out there, and this is all being designed, especially for the landfill, you know. And uh, these uh, designers uh, experiencing that, it's a, it's a very um, it's a wonderful thing for them because the the scales fall from their eyes. They begin to see that um, you know that they don't have to design for landfill. They can design for a, a longer life. 
the the big problem is always the the economics but the economics in my view tend to follow what is really successful if people like something if they like boots that last 10 years instead of one year um, you know they will tend to go for it if they can afford it you know and this this becomes a, a sort of a it's a balance there's no there's no right or wrong in this but um, so Vaughan um, if would you would you uh, agree that in a sense the role of legislation could be termed almost like a, a an iterative sort of ratchet where you can raise standards is that your view or is there more that you'd like to add to that we already have um a piece of legislation here that we designed and came into effect in march of this year around single-use plastics the whole idea of that was to cover off on a range of plastics which are problem at the moment but it also enables the government to add things to it as they see problems emerge and the you know the big things that are going to have to be looked at are things like coffee cups produce bags um, a whole range of uh, packaging material which is designed for single use and designed for for discard um, and that effectively bans it so when you ban something you also have to be mindful of the fact that something else will come in to replace it provided it doesn't it's not in contravention of the ban. So the risk is someone invents some other new polymer which we haven't covered off on. Um, so we have to keep it broad. So this is getting back to design again. You have to design legislation which is can adapt and move with the times uh, without going back to the to the drawing board. When we go back to the drawing board, you can you can probably kiss goodbye two years of of work. To, re, to realign everything and get it, get it back in before the parliament and get it agreed to, and then it becomes law. The, um, and you, you know, the, the drafting of legislation these days, certainly here, you, you have to go through all this consultation. You have to consult with the industry, you have to consult with the public, um, but that's a, that can be a good thing because if we're out consulting with the industry, it alerts us to, issues that we hadn't potentially thought of. If we're consulting with the public, it alerts us to things like people with disabilities, or it could be some other disadvantaged group that we hadn't thought through in terms of the application of the of the, whatever the product is. So I think um, yeah, going forward, the, the, there's probably a, a need for some, a, almost a book, if you like, on how to design legislation as much as it is about how to design products. But while I'm thinking of design of products, there is um, more and more work or um, things being um, available, tools being made available to designers to enable them to test their products before they enter the market to see if they are actually recyclable. Classic is um, a tool called PREP, P-R-E-P. -P. It's built here in Australia by one guy who decided to look at all packaging to see if it could actually survive going through a materials recovery facility. So that's a sorting facility for curbside collected um, recyclables. So that tool is now being applied through Nestle, you know, big, big companies, big international companies that has a market in the UK, US, Singapore, um, and it's constantly being updated, but it's not mandatory. So I can see the day when we have these tools and we're going to say, you know what, you have to run your product through these tools to make sure that it is what it says it is and that transparency that you claim up front can be, can be ratified by the consumer because there should also be a consumer interface. You mentioned QR codes and things like that. If you imagine scanning a product, you go to the website, it tells you how it was designed what were the source materials, what you can do with it after you've finished with it, where it can be sent and, and what its next life is. That would be a very powerful thing to give to consumers. And I think that's the sort of effort or thought process we have to go through to engage consumers in circular economy. Because telling them to consume less and all the rest of it will only work for a very few of us. The rest of us are just trapped in the 
in the in the pipeline, if you like. Yes, and um, everyone has a good excuse. You know, <laughs> I think um, I think you're absolutely right, and I think uh, the prep is a great example because. I can see, you know, in my mind's eye, uh, a prep for plastics, um, you know, a prep for textiles, uh, a prep, prep for fasteners. Now there must be a thousand, you know, a prep perhaps for this most horrendous and complicated thing, <laughs> which we all have, which is uh, the latest I've, I've read on this is that um, uh, every time you throw it away, it's equivalent of uh, 10 years of use, you know, in terms of the environment. So. So, um, you know, these, these uh, you know, the further deeper you go into the mud of our, our stuff, the more you, you start to realize that we're not looking for one blanket solution. We're looking for this, this ratchet effect where you, you're putting pressure on people and you're raising standards towards the goal of actually um, uh, um, creating products that last, uh, okay for the environment and are useful and lovable by their users, not something that people say, oh, it's all, I'll get another one. <laughs> so, okay. So um, any questions out there that uh, we, we should be engaging with? I'm looking this, at this. Yeah. All right. <laughs> so, well, what uh, we're looking while we're looking for questions, I just wanted to um, also point out that this isn't this, this is a global issue, and many of the products that we consume are not manufactured locally. And so, to have real impact, this has to be a global um, kind of effort to enable change. And I know the UN is right behind much of this, but for other governments across planet Earth to actually grasp this and start to work towards some of these legislative changes, I think would be a great thing. And also to learn from each other in terms of what products have been designed that have a circular um, prospect versus those that don't. Um, and sharing those, those case studies and stories, I think is, is a very important thing to do. There's a, we have a question. <laughs> Thank you, Samantha. Uh, what are your thoughts on compostability and holding brands to account? Uh, I've got a small composting worm unit and I put plastic cups and straws in there to see what happens. After months in there, there's very little change. I'm afraid um, this is an interesting question, Samantha. I, I, uh, I've done the same thing. And um, uh, in fact, if you dig in your garden anyway, you'll find hundreds of examples of little bits of plastic. Um, compostability is, is very interesting because with coffee cups, which I think there are over 500 billion produced every year, those throwaway coffee cups, you, you, um, you're looking at um, too many standards that companies have invented because they're not having guidance. So you've got some that are genuinely compostable, some that are only compostable professionally with heat, some that claim, claim to be compostable and aren't. You know, so it's a it's a really uh, standards again are you know are, are part of the problem. The other problem, as one was saying, is that, you know what are the alternatives and um, how are we going to manage the rollout of alternatives? Coffee cups, um, I, I was particularly interested in, and we we went around interviewing people. We did a, a report and a, a journal article, and um, you know the, there's a very uh, interesting issue because a lot of it is to the, ch the change of behavior in society over the last 15, 20 years where everyone is in more of a hurry. And instead of doing the very nice Italian thing of propping yourself up at the bar and having a coffee, there's this desire to wander around with a cup. And, um, and that of course involves more stuff. So um, it, it, it's complicated, but it's a, it's a good question because standards again, it comes back to standards. Now, there's a second question from Grace. Um, Rob, before you move sorry. on, can I just add something there as well? Because I, I think this is one of those um, opportunities for, for design to be redirected and to think differently about the outcomes 
um, of, of, de of a design process. And so when we start to think about um, the day-to-day -day habits that we have and the daily practices that we're engaged with, that can become, um, you know, a, a, a what um, Kudia would call a unit of design, where we actually start to think about what does it mean to go and get a coffee and how can we design experiences of getting a coffee um, that don't necessarily involve the takeaway cup, that, that you know, what, what kind of new configurations could there be um, and new ways of doing those sorts of things um, that can have these sort of spillover effects. And so we start to see then less of a focus on the design of the products and the new materials and the, um, uh, the, the focus starts to then become more on the behaviors that surround the activity itself. And so I think that's a, a, an opportunity that, um, that exists in this kind, of, um, this kind of space where we're potentially opening up um, for some unintended new materials <laughs> to enter into a market um, where we could be thinking about the behaviors rather than the, um, the materials themselves. Excellent, excellent. And I think you're, you're spot on there because um... Uh, you know, when we look at um, most of all that rubbish, Vaughan was talking about, you know, the single use plastics, the free, the free straws, the free, uh, you know, um, that they're all, in a sense, um, uh, you know, part of this, part of this problem of behavior, you know, of, um, routines that people get used to. Um, um, now, there's a question here on um, country most successful country. There's a really good report, the CGRI report, which looks at um, circ circularity gap report, it's called. So if you look that up, uh, you'll be able to um, find out a bit more about it. One of the problems is um, globalization because very few of our products are made where we are um, usually. Even if you're in China, surrounded by factories, you'll find some of the things that are in your hand, um, you know, bits of them will be made in Vietnam or elsewhere. And, um, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a vast, um, you know, 90% of everything we use is, is shipped to us, you know, in, in most cities uh, on those enormous ships, which we know nothing about. We, we've never actually been onto. So, <laughs> yeah, so um, this is globalization, but you know, from where we are, we can we can push standards upwards, and this is where there is hope. And given the fact that the circular economy uh, concerns consumption, and consumption is responsible for sixty five percent of our emissions, this is an area of hope. You shouldn't see this as, you know, all about waste. This is an area of hope in terms of changing consumption, and changing design for consumption. Right. So. Um, Sweater, I need your guidance, I think. Um. Yeah, hey, uh, Robert, are we uh, done here? I think the Q&A, the questions have been answered. Yeah. yeah. So any other, Vaughan, um, would you like to, would anyone like to finish off just a few, few words before we go? Yeah. Um, suffice to say that um, in, in terms of the, which, which country or region is doing best on circular economy? Uh, that's a really difficult question for all the reasons that you mentioned. But also when, when they do measure, um, they're only finding them seven or eight percent or you know 12 percent circular. Part of the problem is that we don't have metrics that enable us to measure circularity because our economic systems have been defined by linear and our by GDP. So it's not how, how good you are at producing something cleverly, it's how much it's worth. We have to start thinking of new metrics to measure circularity. And it can't be just that you have a policy about it, you actually have to be able to demonstrate the changes in, in the economy and, and what underpins those changes. And the values of not just the, the monetary value, but the other values that are brought to bear through that change to the economy through, through applying circularity. I think they're the key things that we need to be working on in the very near future. Thanks, that's great. And um, you know, the 
measuring is critical. And what is interesting is that in terms of the two directions of um, technologies engagement in the circular economy, measurement is tends to be one, and the other one um, tends to be actually, uh, you know, the technology of, of making things more more cyclable, more cy circular. Yeah. So, Paul, have you got anything you want to add? Or yes, uh, just responding to Layla's uh, question in the Q and A. Hi, Layla. Um, I just wanted to uh, say from my own experience with my own products, which we ex export to 60 countries, uh, Scandinavian countries are the ones that uh, I, I think best use the CE mark and, and um, are most applying the circular economy principles. For example, Volvo Trucks, who are based in Gothenburg in Sweden, I believe they're now implementing a process within their business where they're taking back end of life vehicles and, and refurbishing them and, and harvesting them to uh, reuse the, uh, the components. So uh, I, I think that is um, a great move. For, for all of those people uh, listening who are wondering how to engage a designer, I can tell you that the, um, the Indian Design Council, the Australian Design Council, the Malaysian Design Council, Singapore, Hong Kong, Taiwan, Korea, they, they are all actively developing design challenges on a regular basis, focusing on sustainability. And right now the World Design Organization, which is the peak body, uh, they're running a two week uh, World Design Challenge from the 24th of May to the 4th of the 6th. And uh, there are teams put together from all six continents uh, to find solutions to uh, specific problems. And the same thing is happening in all of those other design councils that I mentioned. So, and then finally, um, uh, industry really has to get on board here. For example, in, in Australia, um, the Australian Design Council has been recently formed and the council members are all captains of industry and we're, we're talking about chairman of, of the largest bank in Australia and I think one of the top 10 banks in the world is on this council. Uh, so I can assure you, at least in Australia and certainly in uh, beginning in India and, and Korea and Scandinavia, um, the industry, industry captains are acutely aware now of the benefits that can be derived by um, applying, encouraging industry to step out of their comfort zone, collaborate and apply design thinking to, the, to their entire business model. It's happening and those companies that, that do not do so will fall behind. Thank I think you, that's Paul. all I have to say. Thank you. <laughs> Nikki. <laughs> I'll be very brief because I know we're out of time, but I, I would just add um, to what Paul and Vaughan have both said that um, really what we're starting to look at here is um, design um, at a systems level, design that copes with um, far more complexity than what it's ever had to deal with before, that becomes far more aware of the unintended consequences, of the, the things that we bring into being as a result of the things we design today. Um, and so part of what we're really looking at there is the way that, um, that these materials change based on their context, based on their use, based on their life, um, and, and starting to think about ways that we can apply design further up um, the, the food chain so that we're not stuck at the end of this pipeline, making things pretty and, and more saleable, but rather, you know, thinking um, at a much earlier stage strategically and, and um, in circular ways about what we're actually bringing into being. So it's a, a different way of thinking about um, design and the kind of um, ways that we can apply design. Thank you. Thanks so much. And thank you, Sveta. Um, I think we should probably call it a day. And, uh, and thank you for uh, those who listened in and uh, those who asked questions as well. Thanks. Thank you, Robert. Thanks a lot for putting this webinar together. And thank you to uh, Nikki, Paul, and Vaughan for the time that you've spent today. I'm quite sure while uh, certain examples 
our race specific to the context of Australia, I mean, what you spoke about pretty much applies uh, globally, the concept of what you spoke. So thanks a lot. And uh, to those listening in, this webinar will go up in a couple of weeks to our website, but you can listen to it once again on demand since you've registered for it. And uh, we have another webinar, which is going to happen in another couple of weeks time. So please uh, sign up to our newsletter so you get updates about uh, the other webinars that's going to come up. Have a good day. Bye-bye. Thanks. Bye.